Hi. Hi. Good evening. How are you? Are you Dana? Good. I'm Emily. What's your name? I'm Malia. Malia, nice to meet you. Yeah, I'm Emily, so I work with Dana. Right on. Well, I appreciate your guys' emails. Oh, yeah. <laughs> she is okay. effective at communication. <laughs> Hey, I see Dr. Warren just logged in. Good evening. Uh, what? One second. <laughs> can you hear me? Yes. No, I can hear Sorry. you. Sorry. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> I responded in my head. <laughs> <laughs> Malia, wow. You sure do make a transformation. <laughs> oh, from before. Oh the my goodness. Bun and done and, and, and what, a little hair cap. Yeah. Oh my gosh. What a difference. <laughs> beautiful. Well, thank you. I thought you did it before, but I mean, you just, woo. Hey, you know. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you. You look beautiful yourself. I'm glad to see that you're doing well. I'm excited uh about tonight. Yeah, so far it's been good. I really like the panel. And yeah. I want to ask Deidre if um, if we could get a copy of that if that panel presentation to help us with the social marketing campaign. Oh, I'm sure she'll say yes. Because they gave a lot of great information that will help us with messaging and education through our messages. Absolutely. Yeah, I really loved the whole presentation. I was disappointed to leave a little bit early, but when the doctors were presenting, but Dr. Richardson, I, I think everybody can agree that that was great how she intertwined oh my the gosh. historical aspect. She, I, I, I don't even, I never met her, but she is phenomenal. So Yeah, that was great. That was, I mean, I learned a lot. I'm sure you did too, where it was like, okay, yeah, let's really dig into it. Let's look at it. Yeah, I learned so, a lot from um, the gentleman, I forget, Wallace? The one who actually talked about the ingredients. Yes. Which I think is important. Yeah. Yes. Yes. About what's in it. So I'm yes. just like that panel educated me thoroughly. So Absolutely. yeah, I mean, I knew a lot of this, but not that much, you know, I the know. science behind it, the what's in the vaccines, which we don't really hear a lot about unless we look it up, you know? Yes. And everything's just been rolling out. So yeah. I like your little, what's this? You got a little frame on here? Little pearls? Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you can put a little frame on it. I'm getting oh. more. I, I'm not, I admittedly, I'm not the most technically savvy, Emily. I know you're our support <laughs> session. Oh, and there's, em, I don't know Emily. But hey, I'm Emily. <laughs> hi, Emily. I'm sorry. I've been no, like, I'm all Googling eyed over Malia. Get out. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> oh, man. So, Emily, thank you. Yes, I'm just here to help. So I enjoy hearing how much you love each other. So <laughs> <That's Yeah. really laughs> yeah. you're you're from uh, uh, University of Colorado. Yes, I'm with the Rocky Mountain Public Health Training Center and just helping. Yeah, run. I remember your name in the email. Oh, oh great. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I look at all that stuff. Yeah, <laughs> we're they're very select about what emails people get. So I'm glad to hear I was listed on an email. <laughs> okay. yeah, your contact information, where you were at. Well, yeah, if you need anything um, for sure, just let me know. I'll do my best and about five minutes before we start, I have some intro slides that I'll present. And then once I stop presenting those right at, uh, what is it, 620, then whoever's presenting first can start sharing. I don't know who's presenting first. <laughs> I have, and I'm going off of the webinar guide that was produced by Garrett. Mm -hmm. Oh, and, yeah, let me um, look at that. So I know we get started at 620. It's 607 now. Mm -hmm. And I understand our purpose right now is just to make sure that the camera and audio works and is enabled. So I see from the listing, um, session support, that would be you, Emily, yeah. are, are going to run slides with music Yep. at 6.05. Did we already pass that? Oh, yeah, I can. Um, I think I start that about five minutes until I don't need to do that when it's just us. Once we start okay. the webinar, I'll launch that. 
Okay, and then I'll follow afterwards with the welcome introduction, um, introduction of your biography, Dr. Warren, and yeah. yeah, and then it will be all you. All right. Yep. All and me. You, if you want, I know we have access to the Q and A, the question and answers. Um, I can read those aloud. They told us to ask the presenters if you wanted us to answer the questions throughout the session or if you wanted to answer the questions if there were any posted. Um, I'm partial to engaging the audience during the presentation. Okay. Because um, it makes it more interesting for me as a presenter. Okay. Sure thing. It's as opposed to just running my mouth the entire time. Um, okay. Yeah, but we don't want to be overwhelmed because then I may not get through the slides, which, you know, you know I'm one of those folks that go with the flow. Good. So, okay. You know what I, I mean? <laughs> I like organic. I like organic All interaction. Right. So I have a whole slideshow prepared, but I would love questions if they have them. Um, okay. I'll keep whatever, my eyes open whatever point. Yeah. Okay. And I know that's my, my role and responsibility as well. So I'll just keep my eyes open so we don't overlook anything. Um, yeah. And just point it out from there. But great, I, I can go with that. Should I put up a back a backdrop to my thing? It's completely your discretion. Yeah. I know there there's a few people that are just absolutely do not want, they feel as though it's violating the entry of their home, <laughs> I've heard. And seriously, oh. they've had classes on it where it's, I want to filter no matter what. I don't want work in my home. Um, and then you have others where it's, it's okay. You know, I've, I've seen various things. So we're in this new virtual world. Well, I don't have a green screen, so I get sick of being a part of the background and coming out of the background and going back <laughs> into the background. Well, and I've heard different reviews on that too. I had one of my friends out East. In fact, she said, Malia, for the life of God, please don't put a backdrop where you're on the beach and the waves. And then I happened to be at one a webinar and I saw someone with at the background and I started <laughs> cracking up. Actually, it was Eric Moore that first showed me that in our first meeting. And I <laughs> told him that same, uh, same story. And I was laughing. I said, yeah, my friend says there's one with beach. And he hit it real quick. And he said, you mean this one? I said, <laughs> but I, I don't mind. I mean, to each and every one their own. Yeah. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And then well, I, I, I've had one too, where I had my three-year-old son when I learned that it was President's Day and his daycare happened to be closed. And he, he decided to jump in real quick at one point and he saw a little <laughs> hand in his face. <laughs> Whenever I'm talking to somebody with kids, the kids always walk by the background and do and something. It was inevitable. I was sweating more than anything. And the other person on the other side was so forgiving and was like, I have a three-year-old too. So actually, I really like seeing this. And I was just like, oh my gosh. All right. It makes sense. I mean, what are you going to do? <laughs> I mean, we're working from home, you know? Yeah. And kids, they got to do what they got to do sometimes. They do. No matter what we say. <laughs> so true. That's so true. Yeah, I mean, I got a 16 year older, but he wouldn't come out and walk in front of the screen. He would, he would just trust me out some other way. <laughs> well, I don't, and I'm sure you've heard the stories on the news of funny stories of some things that have happened to people during webinars where I guess my mom was laughing. She said one person was in, in the middle of a meeting, her and my uncle, and he forgot he was wearing his pajama pants, so to say, underneath. And he jumped up to grab something and everybody that was watching saw his underwear and was like, oh. <laughs> he sat back down, he saw the expressions of people like, oh my God. And <laughs> he kept going, but it made the news because it was recorded and, and yeah, they've had, they've had circumstances where that's happened too. So it's like, we can laugh. Oh my laugh. gosh. Uh, you know, <laughs> you know cause sometimes all you need is a shirt. Hey, but hey, you gotta, well, but you gotta remember, you, know, you got on a shirt. That's it. <laughs> because my cousin, and he actually lives out there in Jersey too. He's he's always worked remotely from home, and he oh. loves it. He said, "I wear my suit, my tie, and my 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 top," and he's sitting outside it out. What's underneath it? I was like, "Yeah, but when you're, you know, sometimes your mind, you're into something. You might make that mistake that made the news." That's right. Might forget. Never know. Who got that right? I don't know who that was. But they got yeah, hung up on. How's the weather out there? Okay. Um, 
Yeah, today I think was sunny. Yesterday was sunny. Um, you know, we had that weird snowstorm. And um, let me get this call. Go Give ahead. A second. All right. Yeah, we got quite a few minutes. Emily, is Dana going to join us tonight, or is she kind of going back and forth between the other sessions as well? Yeah, she is not joining because I think she's technically the host for all of these sessions and okay. was worried about messing something else up. But I can chat with her if you need anything from her specifically. Oh, not at all. Not at all. I was really nervous about this. This is the first time I've emceed yeah. a webinar. <laughs> well, that's I'm exciting. Not, I'm not the technical savvy person, so it's like... Yeah. Well, hopefully you don't need much technical savvy. <laughs> <laughs> I hope not. I yeah. mean, your guys' position as the training center when we got the overview guide, it, you know, it was enough to make my fingers sweat already. Oh. Where it's like, hey, detail this and look at this, but that's just my own nerves about yeah. technology. I got to get with it, I guess, so I'm told. Are either of you presenting something on the screen? I, I believe Dr. Warren has her. Okay. Yeah. It'll be smooth. <laughs> Today's my birthday. Oh, happy birthday. Really? That was a happy birthday call. Yeah. Happy birthday. Thank you. Well, where's your crown? You could have been wearing this. You know, <laughs> your princess crown. You should have put that on. Everybody could have known what it was. That's <laughs> all right. I got the crown on. It's, it's metaphorical. I know that's, that's right. right. Happy birthday. Thank you. Happy birthday. That's a blessing. Thank that's you. nice. Thank you. Thank well, I hope when we're all if we're all done here, you take some time to celebrate. Yeah. Well, I'll celebrate if you tell me how old you think I am. <laughs> Never guess. Family, you know it. Black don't crack. I don't. I don't guess. I don't even. I don't even state ages. And people have guessed my age. I said I'll take it for what it is, and we'll just That's go. That's what I do. I don't state it either, but I always want to know <laughs> what age I look like. <laughs> I would never know. Emily, how old do you think I am? You're like great. <laughs> how old? I know that's right. <laughs> <laughs> she sounds like a man trying to stay out of it. <laughs> oh, it's just a number. You yeah. look phenomenal. <laughs> no it looks worries. great on you, that dress. Uh, How do you feel? I think I'll get started with the slideshow, if that's okay with you two, and start the webinar and let people in. Sounds right. good to me. Okay. It'll just take me a second. There's something real quick.
I'm here. Sorry. Okay. Hello. Welcome and good evening to the Center for African American. I can't Health. hear you. Can you hear me, Emily? Dr. Warren, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Hopefully, the I can't hear anybody. Can... Uh oh. One moment, we're trying to figure out some technicalities. Let's see what's going on here. Can you guys hear me? All right, can I hear you guys now? I can hear you. Yeah, I just tested. I just ran a test. Emily, you're good on your end? Um, Dr. Jennifer, we could have you call in if that helps, and then you can get the phone audio instead of doing the speaker audio. Oh, but you can't hear me. No, I'm okay. It's working now. I just had to... Um, okay, good. I don't know what happened, but... Zoom is funny. Well, glad it's this. It's out of our control. <laughs> well, it looks like we have a couple of participants who have joined our webinar, Public Housing and Seniors, with Dr. Jennifer Warren. I'm going to go ahead and begin. So again, in restarting and recapping, um, and please, if you'll mute your phones and your audio has already been um, ousted out, um, that is how the session is set up. You won't see a video of your own face, um, but we can see you. And we have a Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. So as I start again, welcome and good evening to the Center for African American Health's first virtual collaborative Black Health Summit 2021. My name is Milia Glapion, and I am the Director of Policy and Advocacy for the Center for African American Health. I want to take the time to thank and give recognition to our sponsors for the summit. That would be Colorado Access, the Colorado Health Foundation, Common Spirit, and Novartis. Um, we really appreciate the fact that we're able to hold tonight's webinar and tomorrow's webinar, and those are our sponsors. Just to go over some friendly technical housekeeping, um, again, you are muted and you will only see the presenters and their slides. There's one presenter, Dr. Jennifer Warren. Uh, what you will find again at the bottom is a Q&A and a chat box. So if you submit questions, our presenters will be able to answer uh, the questions, Dr. Warren will be able to answer the questions and I'll also see the questions that you have submitted. Uh, no one else will see that who's joining. If you want to provide anything to anyone else who's in attendance, you also have the chat option. So on that point, um, please note that you can still register for other webinar sessions at the summit. And if you would please use the hashtag hashtag C-A-A-H-C-B-H-21 on your social media accounts to spread the good word. I am now honored and pleasured to give the introduction of tonight's presenter. For more than 24 years, Dr. Jennifer R. Warren, PhD, community, Comprehensive Community-Based Primary Health Care, has dedicated herself to identifying, exposing, and addressing health inequities and disparities among African Americans of all ethnicities and across the lifespan. She received her Bachelor of Science and Master's in Culture and Communication from New York University then attained her PhD in health communication from Penn State University with specialties in social behavioral science and community health. As a three-year postdoc at the University of Minnesota Medical School, Dr. Warren advanced her training in addic addiction medicine, cancer control and prevention, and tobacco-related health disparities. She also received the highest award for postdoc research research excellence, excuse me. While serving as an assistant professor for 10 years at Rutgers University, she earned the highest award in health justice research. Dr. Warren is now the executive director of the Center for African-American Health Disparities Education and Research Incorporated, a 501c3. Her community-based organization identifies African-American health challenges, conducts health research, and develops and implements community solutions. 
Dr. Warren is also a certified chronic care professional health coach and holds diversity and inclusion leadership, HIPAA, cultural competence and social behavioral and epidemiological research certifications. She received training from the World Health Organization in COVID-19 infection control and prevention and in COVID-19 operational planning organization, guidelines and COVID-19 partners platform to support country preparedness and response and from the Wales Health Consortium in adverse childhood experiences and trauma. Dr. Warren has more than 24 peer-reviewed published articles, chapters, and reports, and over 70 presentations at scientific and community venues. Again, it is my pleasure to now introduce Dr. Jennifer R. Warren. Hello, everyone. I hope you can hear me. I think I need to share my screen. Give me a second to do that. I hope you all are well and enjoying the conference. I know that I am. And welcome so much to the session, Public Housing and Seniors, an incongruent match for COVID-19. Um, <clears throat> again, my name is Jennifer Warren, um, and I'm excited to be here to share this work. Um, it's based on a, a trajectory of research looking at senior housing, senior congregate housing, and um, in public housing authorities and looking at health disparities and health inequities as they relate to the built environment and um, and housing quality. And actually public housing takes on more of an urgency uh, in the pandemic and I will get into that as we move forward. So the agenda today is I'm going to present the epidemiology regarding seniors um, and Blacks and COVID-19. I'll discuss the risk factors of structural racism, congregate housing, and social determinants. Um, I did do a study uh, on seniors living in public housing, and I will present an over uh, overview of that to really highlight some of the, uh, the severe issues that are real, um, um, that uh, provide examples for the uh, risk factors that I'll be sharing with you. And then I'll present some solutions because uh, that's always important when we talk about COVID-19 and Black and African-American communities. So we have 155,000 plus Black lives lost to date from COVID-19. And this presentation was created, I think two days ago. And I got this information from the COVID tracking project. Black senior on COVID-19. We are the people that some in business and government talk about dying as though it would be a good thing for the country and the world. As though we are criminals sucking up their rightful gains. As though our survival steals from them. As though I didn't earn my social security and Medicare every working day of my life. So clearly, this is not the real individual, but a picture, but this relays the sentiment of how many black seniors feel regarding the attention that has been given them during this pandemic. We know that COVID-19 is really targeting aging black, Amer uh, aging black Americans. And we can see here how non-Hispanic Blacks uh, from 65 to 85 and older are really um, uh, have a high rate of uh, mortality of death when it comes to COVID-19. And again, I wanted to share with you some other information, again, this is sort of the epidemiological information that's sort of important. So the hospital rates per 100,000 population by age and ethnicity, this is a little old, but it just goes to show you um, a comparison between different groups regarding the rates of hospitalization between non-Hispanic Blacks and others. And as you can see, our rates are, well, non-Hispanic Indian uh, or Ask Alaska Native is pretty high, but our numbers are pretty high and so are Hispanic uh, and Latino populations. Um, 
but 65 and plus, we really pick up the numbers, um, which shows that we are really hospitalized um, at a much higher rate than other uh, um, uh, ethnicities, especially Black Americans, 65 years and plus. We have another graph here, which I want to share. This is the weekly summary of US COVID-19 hospitalization data, and it's regarding the underlying conditions. And I just wanted to share this with you so you could see the medical conditions that are associated with COVID-19. And we see hypertension is extremely high. Cardiovascular disease is very high. And so is obesity and metabolic diseases. And I think that would be um, diabetes, because I don't see that on here. What is interesting about these data is that they project numbers which are disproportionate within the Black community. Black Americans, especially women, die at much higher rates than any other race or ethnicity from cardiovascular disease. Seniors suffer from hypertension at greater numbers and also cardiovascular disease, but hypertension at greater numbers than other races and ethnicities, as well as diabetes and obesity. So these are uh, underlying conditions that are related to COVID-19 complications. And so it is really important to understand our risk regarding these disease conditions, because if we don't know what we have or not taking care of the underlying conditions that we have, it, put us, it puts black seniors at a higher risk. And so what are the factors that I have uncovered that really um, uh, increase the risk factors for seniors, uh, black seniors? And it's very simple, uh, structural racism, congregate public housing, and the social determinants uh, that exist in this built environment. So structural racism is a system in which policies, institutional practices, and cultural representations often reinforce and perpetuate racial group inequality. It has come about as a result of the way uh, it has come of a, a result of the way that historically accumulated white privilege, national values, and contemporary culture have enacted so as to preserve the gaps between white Americans and uh, Americans of color. And so some of these public policies, as we know, impact our economic situation, they impact our, our education, but they also impact where we live. And congregate public housing is based on or has become really synonymous with sort of the outcomes of redlining and um, put uh, Black Americans who are low income in enclaves or separate them from other people and uh, white people, that is, this red line that draws a line between dominant groups and inferior or mi mi minoritized groups. Congregate public housing plays a role in that. And then there are also social determinants. And I'm going to move on because I can get stuck on this slide, but I have slides to highlight all of these. So when we talk about structural racism, we're going way back to the transatlantic slave trade. Uh, when they bought Africans over on the boat. We're going back to American slavery, where racial residential segregation really began because the big house was somewhere other than the houses for slaves. And they were uh, primarily rather far apart. And then we have emancipation and Jim Crow. And the reason why I'm highlighting this, because if we look at these particular stages of history, and African-American health, we can see how we have a black health deficit. Through the transatlantic slave trade, no health care. American slavery, oh, there was health care, but if you look at Harriet Washington's book, Medical Apartheid, you will see the uh, criminal procedures that were enacted upon slaves. 
Then we had the emancipation where free where slaves were freed and they left, of course, with no health care and only what they had on their back. And they died quite a bit because they suffered disproportionately from diseases and illnesses for which they could not get health. And then we have Jim Crow, which separated blacks from whites and created this further inequity in health care. And then we have redlining where we have communities of individuals um, that used to have hospitals near black communities, but all those hospitals have dried up over the years. And so our access to hospital facilities in many communities um, uh, is, is challenged. And so this sort of sets the black health deficits as they emerge from structural discrimination and racism. And they impact the tool is through law. And we talked about policy a little bit and process. And the systems they impact are public health and health care, neighborhood and built environment, education and economic stability. And for low income black seniors, these, and for all black Americans, and we're talking about black seniors right now, these really impact the health and well being of um, uh, uh, black seniors um, and it's not in a good way. Uh, these forces are intersectional and they all together impact the health and well-being of black seniors. And so when we talk about the health deficits from the history of racism in America, we're looking at some black health senior disparities that have emerged because of these health deficits and a structural racist social system. Black seniors 65 years and older have significantly high comorbidities. That's two or more chronic diseases than across other races and ethnicities. Impoverished seniors are less likely to be mobile. They have some sort of um, ambulatory uh, um, situation where they have uh, less mobility. Seniors living with a mobility disability are at increased risk of uh, unintentional injuries, high blood pressure, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, which heightens their risk of COVID-19 related complications. And these disparities are representative of seniors who reside in congregate public housing and who face adverse social determinants of health as a result of structural racism or systemic inequities, such as residential racial segregation or racial residential segregation. And so we see, when we talk about congregate housing in public uh, housing authorities, seniors make up more than half, 53% of the 1.13 million households living in public housing. They head, the person at the head is 62 years or older. And 47% of the 62 year and older seniors um, um, are uh, able to work. So, I mean, let me just back up for a minute. S public housing, as I just wanna make sure we're on the same page, congregate housing in public housing authorities are buildings set up to house seniors, usually 55 and older. Um, now mandates are loosening those restrictions on age and letting younger people move in. But primarily these are seniors that tend to age in place once they get put and once they decide to live in congregate uh, public housing. And I know we can all recall when COVID-19 first hit and it hit nursing homes, and we went to Senate hearings about nursing homes and seniors living together and the transmissibility of COVID-19 and the amount of deaths that were occurring. Everyone was up in arms, but nobody seemed to think about our seniors living in congregate public housing and the things, situations, the health forecasts and the social determinants that truly increase their risk for COVID-19. And when we talk about public housing being racially, residentially segregated, we're talking about a place or an enclave that suffers from social isolation and little attention. So unlike nursing homes, there are not always nurses or home health aides calling on Black seniors. Poverty and crowding and disorderly neighborhoods is an issue. 
and poverty and crowding, according to the CDC, are associated with risk for COVID-19. There's limited access to services and resources, and that may be access to health services, resources such as emotional, social support, um, limited access to health care, maybe getting pandemic, maybe getting COVID-19 testing, because if we're talking about seniors and the way it was prior, uh, there were long lines waiting to get tested, um, and it was a burden for seniors to go get testing. So there was limited access to those services. There's exposure to environmental toxins in their homes and congregate apartment build buildings provide shared common spaces, shared elevators, shared staircases, mail rooms, hallways, laundry rooms. And on some of these surfaces, the coronavirus can exist for extended period of times, facilitating transmission. Many seniors cannot follow the CDC recommendations on social distancing, on social distancing because of where they live and the crowding. And mask wearing can be an issue because many seniors face financial insecurity and people might go, well, a mask only costs $5. Well, if you're looking at a mask for $5 or $3.50, and then you're looking at something to eat, you might choose to get food as opposed to buying that mask. And then we talk about public housing and social determinants. The quality of housing um, is compromised. So when we talk about public housing and health, I just want to give you a general overall about the health status of individuals who live in HUD assisted housing. Now, if we're talking about se seniors, black seniors who may already have underlying uh, chronic conditions or chronic condition, this is complicated by the fact that individuals in public housing are burdened with hypertension when compared to the general adult publication, uh, po population. They're burdened with heart disease, burdened with diabetes, cancer, asthma, chronic obstructive pulmonary dis disorder. Uh, disease, serious psychological distress, and depression 10 days or longer in bed. So public housing in and of itself has a, a risk factor for our health. So black senior health is impacted by this sort of milieu of, 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 of just this macro sort of health disparities that seem buried within public housing. So when we talk about segregated housing, poor health and adverse environmental and social determinants, you know, we're talking about uh, the idea of stress. When we think about seniors living under these conditions during a pandemic and stress contributes to weathering. And I just really want to get all this health information out there because it's so very important. Weathering or wearing down the physiology of seniors whether you have whether you're living with a mobility disability or not and it affects the ability of the body to defend itself against disease making black seniors more vulnerable to covid-19 and chronic stress can be compounded by social isolation which is a problem for public housing in its separation from the rest of mainstream society and it's faced by many black seniors who may live alone within these socially isolated neighborhoods. So, you know, I just wanna share this. I'm gonna go back because I talked about housing quality is compromised. And I just wanna bring uh, to you, when I talk about housing quality compromised, I'm talking about environmental health hazards. And um, seniors living in congregate housing based on an assessment done by HUD are exposed to pest allergens, dust mite, cockroach, rodent. They're exposed to mold, black mold. They're exposed to bacterial endotoxins, 
pesticides, unhygienic conditions overall, and poor ventilation. And ventilation is required to clean the air to reduce the risk of COVID-19. So when we talk about the housing of quality being compromised, the environment within that house is compromised by airborne toxins. And these are the apartments in which many black seniors live. So I'm just gonna share with you a brief study, keep my eye on the time, um, a brief study well, I'm going to do a brief overview of a study that uh, my group conducted uh, looking at seniors in public housing. And the reason why we did this study is because throughout the pandemic, first of all, I was just getting pissed off over the fact that everybody was screaming about these nursing homes and nobody cared about seniors living in congregate public housing. That was the first issue. But then as I was looking into the research on seniors in congregate housing, um, on databases where there should be published research in this area, there was no published research on black seniors living in congregate public housing. And I have to say this study is published and it's the first published study that addresses COVID-19 among seniors living in public congregate public housing and congregate housing apartments. And I thought this study was important because seniors, black seniors need to be pulled into the discourse very clearly regarding the risk um, and their exposure to these risks. So this pilot study assessed health behaviors, healthcare utilization, um, and social determinants among African-American seniors um, with and without mobility disabilities. There were 131 public housing residents, and this is in the Northeast, I'm in Atlantic City, so this was done in New Jersey. Um, who self-identified as Black or African American and were between the ages of 25 to 85. The reason why we did that age range is because younger people are now moving into congregate senior housing. And they had to reside in public housing developments that serve seniors or people living with a disability. And so we did a survey that drew on evidence-based questions from public health national public health surveys, and then we analyzed these data. And what came out is we had a split between disability and, and no disability. So people with a mobility disability and those without. And I found this information extremely um, insightful. This is really just a socioeconomic, um, uh, social demographic information. What I want to come to here is the same table. This is for disability. This is for no disability. And as we can see, black seniors with disabilities suffer disproportionately. Well, it could be suffer more, I should say, from health conditions than seniors without. And that's not to say seniors without should not be um, 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 addressed. But the issue is, is that there's no one doing this sort of specific sort of look at different types of Blacks um, when it comes to COVID-19. So seniors are not the same. Some have disabilities and some do not. And clearly those with disabilities suffer more from health conditions and chronic health conditions, especially diabetes and high blood pressure. And I really want to make it clear that high blood pressure is, um, is the number one underlying condition that Black seniors find themselves, find themselves hospitalized when it comes to COVID-19. That's from the CDC. So, um, and we see many seniors living with mobility disabilities have high blood pressure and diabetes, another underlying condition that increases risk, um, as well as asthma because COVID-19 is a respiratory disease. And tobacco use um, diminishes the immune system somewhat. So um, we see more folks without a disability smoking, but they're almost similar, which, which is an immunocompromised system. So the tobacco smoke increases their risk as well. 
And now we're going to look at the social determinants of the study uh, by disability status. And remember, these are all seniors and all at risk. So we clear with Hello? Good, we can hear you again. Oh, my whole, everything just went away. The presentation and everything. The Wi-Fi, you know? <laughs> we just missed you for about a minute, so don't worry. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. No worries. So they're concerned about things like lead in their water, chemicals in the outdoor air, and they should be more concerned about the chemicals in their apartment. Um, but you can see the concern is high. And then when we look at quality of life, um, they're basically the same, uh, but disability, seniors with a, a, a mobility disability have, um, fifth, of course, physically, the quality of life is lower. Psychologically, it's lower. Social relations, it's lower. And the environment, it's a little tougher than those without a disability. But if we're going to apply this study um, to the COVID-19 pandemic, it reveals significant challenges for all seniors and in particularly those living with mobility disabilities. In the present study, Black seniors living with mobility disabilities had a higher prevalence, like I showed you, of chronic diseases and poorer overall health than compared to those without mobility dis disabilities. And that increases their risk for COVID-19 complications, which is a problem because many folks who are living with a mobility disability may not be able to go outside. And of course we have stay in the house, sequester. Um, so those living with a mobility disability are really um, facing some challenges when it comes to dealing with this pandemic. The findings of this study support the research that seniors in public housing are more likely to have a chronic disease and to rate their health as fear to poor. And studies report increases in related anxiety, depression, and stress. That could be ameliorated or reduced with some social support, but due to the coronavirus, regular sources of social support or emotional support may not be there for Black seniors living in public housing. The Black church is the place for some of that food, to feel full, to have hope, to keep the faith, and they're closed. Many are. And there are some seniors who have to reach church virtually, but they may not have telehealth technology, I mean, uh, Wi-Fi technology or computer technology and or not know how to utilize it to reach virtual sources of support. And those psychological issues such as anxiety and depression can arise due to the pandemic within um, Black seniors and the effects of social isolation, which I really want to bring out because we have these chronic diseases, we have this social environment, and then we have these segregated um, housing structures. And this all happens in isolation because the social attention isn't there, clearly. And the effects of social isolation mean worsen cardiovascular disease outcomes. Frailty, 
Alzheimer's dementia, worse control of diabetes, poor sleep, worsen depression, and systemic inflammation. And so it is incumbent upon us who know of seniors living in congregate public housing to reach out to them to provide support in any way that we can as organizations and as individuals and as families and friends. And in particular to those living with mobility disabilities who may have a harder time than those living without. And the worst thing about all of this is when I did research into the housing um, and urban development, Department of Housing and Urban Development, there were no HUD regulations or no federal government regulations that mandated that these public housing authorities that are taking care of our black seniors, there was no regulation to report cases or inform residents. So there could be seniors walking around in those congregate spaces very ill, very transmissible. There are no safeguards in place to protect uh, other residents and no oversight. And I kind of know this because of my relationship with the housing authority I work with on this study. I've been working with seniors there for maybe about six, seven years. And I can tell you a story when the pandemic hit in March, um, the administrators flew out of the administrative offices. And I found out through my sources that they sent every senior an envelope with four masks in the envelope to last them for however long they thought the pandemic was going to last. So there is no oversight. Seniors should be provided with everything that they need to protect themselves due to the hazardous conditions in which they live in their homes, due to the hazardous conditions in their neighborhoods, and due to the increase of chronic conditions among Black seniors. Oversight is necessary. And when I say no regulations, I mean HUD only got suggestions from the federal government. We suggest you do this. We suggest you do that. The one thing they did do was lock seniors up in congregate housing during the height of the pandemic. Nobody could get in or out. Family members weren't allowed. So those seniors who were suffering in silence, and there are shut-ins, people who don't come out, no one would know about them. No one was checking on them. No family members could get in. And another story is of a family member who kept calling uh, their, 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 their elderly, I think it was their grandma who lived in public housing, in the Congress public housing, and she wouldn't answer the phone. And this was during COVID-19, the height. She wouldn't answer the phone, so they went there. She went there herself. And they would not let her in the building. She explained to them that she could not get a hold of her grandma. And they said, I'm sorry. She came back with her pastor. They had a hard time letting them in. They came back with the police. It took the police to let these individuals in to check on their grandma. And if they hadn't gotten there when they got there, grandma might have passed because grandma had a stroke while sitting on the toilet, which is another risk factor for COVID-19. So these are some of the conditions in which our black seniors live in public housing. No oversight, no help and people who work around them who do not care in many cases. And I have to make a disclaimer that there are many new public housing and uh, um, uh, uh, developments going up that seem wonderful. And then there are some that are still stuck in the old days. In the old days, I mean, they're not trying to build equity or services for seniors or address their unique needs as a population. And then there are other public housing authorities that have moved into the 21st century that know that black seniors health needs need to be met. So with most seniors having chronic disease and high comorbidities, they live in highly transmittable built environments. Their susceptibility is increased due to stress with the pandemic, maybe lack of support, disorderly neighborhoods, 
financial distress, not knowing if they have COVID, not being able to get an appointment, being concerned about the vaccination, wondering should they get it. And then they have the underlying conditions, which the stress impacts as well. And as a matter of fact, there have been cases where some Black seniors have died alone in their apartments because they could not get out um, or could not access the services due to mobility disabilities. And that is very sad. So some of the solutions, I went to the United Nations because the United Nations seemed like they just had it together as far as the solutions to deal with senior care. And they didn't just talk about nursing homes. And let me tell you about nursing homes. There are different nursing homes for different types of people. And there are really nice nursing homes which are affordable by uh, whites and many low income seniors who have to go into nursing homes, go into those that are run by the federal government and they are poor quality. So I just wanted to add that tidbit in there. We think about the quality of public housing for seniors and then the quality of the nursing homes many of them have to go to due to the financial difficulties that they face. But the United Nations wants to ensure that older persons are identified uh, um, and attended to as soon as possible. The thing about living at home by yourself, if you are a senior, is that cognitive decline is real in COVID-19. And there have been studies that have shown that dementia can emerge from this cognitive decline. So a senior living alone since March, at this point in time now, if someone goes check on them, they could be suffering from Alzheimer's dementia. So folks need to be identified and attended to as soon as possible. And that's also with the vaccine, educating black seniors, letting them know many of them are getting the vaccination, but then there's some who are still hesitant and they're still believing, you know, they have a connection to those horrible, um, uh, uh, the way in which the medical industry has treated Blacks, so they just can't get over that. But we have to ensure that seniors understand the vaccination, know what's in it, understand how it can save their lives. Ensure continuity of adequate healthcare services for older uh, individuals. And I wanna highlight the mental health care as one of them. And we need to get paid care workers to go out to their homes. Some folks have Medicaid care and they do have access to um, home health aides, but then many seniors for some reasons do not. Ensure that medical decisions are based on individual clinical assessments and not some one over the black seniors. Oh, all the black seniors have this, so we're going to do that. No, the United Nations want to ensure that there is no one monolithic group of black seniors or seniors period, but that everyone gets patient-centered care regarding their issues. And when we talk about these individualized clinical assessments, we want to also be cognizant of implicit bias and racism in healthcare, because that can impact the quality of care that seniors get once they're hospitalized or going into the hospital for, for treatment. And here it is, assess the needs of older and of persons, particularly those isolated or those with limited mobility and cognitive decline in order to provide support. Support older persons and those providing care um, so they can access digital communications or have alternative ways to keep in contact with their families. I know a lot of seniors use their, if they are, um, uh, um, I don't know how to put it, but some seniors are really tech savvy and they have their smartphones and they can get online, they can connect with people without having a computer. But there needs to be more in the way of making sure that all seniors have access to some type of remote or telehealth ability to contact physicians, to register for vaccinations, 
to do what they need to do to ensure their health during this time. And increase mobile services. The, pu the public housing community I work with, um, when I first started, when I went back to talk to them in March about the COVID, about what was happening with COVID-19, um, many seniors can't leave and there were no mobile services provided. And to this date, there have been no mobile services provided to senior, seniors at this one public housing um, uh, uh, facility that I uh, work with, which is sad because mobility disability hinders movement. Some seniors just don't wanna go outside because of the unsafe environment. And in the times we're living in, there's more theft, there's more crime in these neighborhoods because people are sick and, and some people are desperate. These are desperate times we live in. So mobility, a mobile clinic, mobile testing, mobile vaccination is what needs to occur to help black seniors to deal with the pandemic and hopefully keep them out of the hospital and keep them safe and alive. Thank you and question and answer time. Again, my name is Dr. Warren and I thank you for listening to me. I hope this was uh, an informative presentation. Um, I know when I was doing the research, I was, uh, I was really taken aback by uh, the things that were happening for black seniors living in public housing. So if anybody has any questions, comments, concerns, additions, clarifications, I'm welcome to all of that. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Warren. We appreciate your presentation. One question that I do have to ask is, will the slides in your presentation be available to participants? Yes, I'm going to put them up on the WOVA. The, the, can they access that? Yes. And also, I let everyone know who's in attendance in the chat room that when you go to WOVA, the website that you registered at, if you go to the main navigation settings, you can scroll down to speakers and input Dr. Jennifer Warren's name, and you'll find her profile information, her biography, and her contact links where you can also send her directly any questions and follow up. And I also uploaded the, um, the article that this was based on, the article that we published. So that's up there too. Awesome. And we yeah. have a question that came in. Um, the question is, any signs yet of change in HUD policy or attitude with new administration? Um, the HUD website looks amazing now. <laughs> I've been checking it out and they have gotten more re they've gotten more resources up there um, uh, um, to address uh, COVID-19. Um, the resources are not necessarily senior targeted though, it's for overall, but I am happy that they are making strides with putting in their links to resources for people who could navigate to that site. So um, they have made some strides uh, since the new administration, which is a good thing. And if I could chime into that, one of the questions that I popped into my mind was you were presenting and you were stating uh, that nationally there's no data on COVID-19 spread in the low housing income community. And, and public housing community. Public housing. And so I'm wondering now, since that wasn't required and they deemed it as independent living, are there others who are collecting that information now? Or we, is there still no data out on how COVID has spread in public housing? None that I can find. HUD definitely doesn't have it on their website, which you know they would not. Um, and I cannot find those data. And there's no national database on COVID-19 yet. You know what I mean? Like they have national databases on lots of different health issues. There's none yet to really look at age um, um, or zip code because zip code would help um, locate some of these public housing authorities and seniors. So um, no. <laughs> and I like that and I prompted with the question, HUD's policy attitude with the new administration. I'm wondering if going forward under the Biden administration, since HUD and the CDC um, is not collecting that information when will we, will, will there ever be that information? And if not, 
Dr. Warren, what are your sentiments, if any, in your opinion, why that's not being gathered? Do you think it has specifically um, demographic impact and is it related to the fact that those who are in public housing, low income housing and public assisted housing are a forgotten population to where they don't want those numbers shown? You know, Malia, that's like the million dollar question. I have no idea why this information is not being collected because there have been hundreds of black seniors who've died in congregate um, uh, black housing, just based on my knowledge of working with public housing authorities in different states. And um, um, some states handle it differently. Like they will require the collection of some information. But here in, uh, um, and I'm just saying in New Jersey in particular, and I'm, the HUD site is for all public housing, but I know in particular in New Jersey that information is not being collected. Um, and I think it's because, you know, I hate to say everything is based on structural racism, but I believe that because Black seniors are a marginalized group and they're vulnerable, a vulnerable population, and they're living in these enclaves, these pockets of poverty that are disconnected from the mainstream, I think that there is a sense of forgottenness that might be there. And there are some clinics and places that claim they're doing work um, to outreach. But whenever I check for some reason, the outreach really never gets to the seniors. It's always the seniors having to get to the outreach. Hmm. So it's a very interesting dynamic that is occurring. Um, and if the seniors don't have health, uh, home health aides, family, or friends that really care about them, they are really in a precarious situation considering how the public health attention that's not on them. You know what I mean? So. Yeah, I, I think it's striking and scary at the same time, as you stated in the beginning of the COVID pandemic, there was a lot of media and attention on the nursing homes, but the forgotten were those in public housing and low income housing. And so their learning of who had COVID came about by volunteers of family members going, going to visit their family members. Yes. And, and consequently, possibly they're also getting sick and they're also getting ill and it's it's also one where when you say, you know, seniors within public housing and seniors as a whole, the age being 62, and it will all be there if we're not already. Um, and it's just so paralyzing to know that that's not being, and it wasn't designated to be tracked. And both definitely calling a need and demand for an urgency with the new administration to have that information. Public housing gathers massive information of even those who are able to receive public housing, low income housing. So to just overlook that is just preposterous. And I thank you for your presentation and slides. There's a lot that I will personally follow up with you. I used to work with Department of Housing and Urban Development. And, and so just, just hearing this and knowing this and not seeing media really focus on this area, I haven't in everything that I've seen in public relations really looked at this. And if you were to even perform a Google search now or even enter it, you would find articles from maybe over eight months ago. Yeah, so, and I couldn't even find statistics on the current no. um, rate of deaths among black seniors. All I found was the overall number of blacks. So that data is even hard to find. Yes. And I also understand. You, I mean, the numbers, us, like like a whole number. They give right. percentages, but never a whole number. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Right. No, I'd also like to look because I know a lot of the attendees are attending stateside from all other states. Um, but to really call and ask, you know, your legislatures, what is the information that you could possibly gather and plug it into their ear tomorrow at our summit? If you haven't registered, we have the Black Caucus and panel, and this would be a great plug in and segue in a conversation um, which needs to be initiated and needs to be further reviewed. Yeah. Um, but definitely uh, public housing and your mentioning of New Jersey, New York, of course, you have the larger cities who are in the top 10. Uh, that utilize public housing, but it's one where everyone, wherever you're living, uh, this information is critical and, and it affects our community. 
Yeah. Um, so we definitely thank you for what you provided and we'll look forward to uh, your slides being uploaded in the HOPA website. Yes. And again, for those of you who joined us tonight, we thank you. We thank you for your patience. Please thank let you. us know um, how you enjoyed the session. Please reach out to Dr. Warren or anyone at the Center for African American Health by going to the WOVA website. Um, there will be a rating, um, a like session. And if you're joining us on your mobile phone, there's a three stars rating. We thank you and we hope you join our other sessions. And again, feel free to submit those questions continuously, even after we get off tonight. And please do, um, everyone, stay informed and stay safe. Thank you. And thank Bye, everybody. You to Rocky Mountain Public Health Training Center. Emily, thank you for your technical assistance thank tonight. You, Emily. Dr. Yeah. Warren, take care. Yes, Good night, thank everyone. You. Good night. Bye bye. Be safe.